I just wondered whether you had any thoughts from your experience about um, helping families discuss these difficult issues. Um, Is it me or...? Yeah, yeah. And just basically having difficult conversations yeah. with families yeah. or yeah. is a good place to start. Yeah, but yeah that's right. Yeah, it is. It can be extraordinarily difficult, and many is the hard time I've had in intensive care. Uh, you know, in the the nice crowded little office next to the intensive care unit with the families, while somebody's on a ventilator, unconscious or semi-conscious or whatever it might be. Uh, you need to do what I said. You need to find out what they know, and often that is, you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised at how little or how crazy what they think is, I mean, crazy to our ideas. And when you've straightened that out, you then may be in a better position to ask them, you know, what they think is going to happen and so on, and then discuss that and take it along bit by bit. So it's a, it's a matter of making sure that you clearly understand each other and understand what you're talking about. And um, the challenge for me coming here from living in North Yorkshire and working there for 30 years is that all of a sudden I'm exposed to 150 languages and cultures that I don't understand. Whereas I had 30 years of getting to grips with the Yorkshire mentality and thought I knew where I was. And uh, that's where having somebody from the community who knows what's going on to help you or as we had last year, a year before at Monash with a very, very difficult Chinese family having a very competent Chinese anaesthetist who helped us with the discussions. You just have to do what you can, do your best, get the help you need if you can get it. Silence. <laughs> oh, no, there's, there's somebody waving down here. Somebody's waving down here. Sorry, sorry. Jump up and down. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, is it enough for the power of attorney or the medical power of attorney to know verbally what the person's yes. issues are, or do you need to actually have them? No, no. Them? Once the power of attorney has been given, and if it's legally and correctly given, then we have to assume that that person knows what their. Um, that the person who granted it wanted and can give us good sense on that. So that has to be assumed. Unless you think that they're not acting in the person's best interests. And if you think that they're not acting in the person's best interests, for instance, if they're asking you not to give a treatment which you think is eminently sensible and useful and which you would like to give, and they can't give you a sound reason for why not, then you can go to VCAT and have it reviewed. And maybe a guardian will be appointed, and so on and so on. And that's not likely to happen very often. Um, and the one, one occasion when I remember it happening was over a really simple thing, which was actually put in, in a catheter. And it wasn't until another sister of the elderly lady, who was dying and so on, turned up and said, oh no, um, you know, she had a really terrible time, blah, blah, and give us reasons why this old lady would never, ever have wanted to have a catheter put in. So that's, uh, that's the only circumstance, if you think they're not acting in the person's best interest, and that's a difficult judgment, but it's one that, you know, can, it can arise, it can arise. And of course, you, can, you, have, you have all seen, fought out in the press, what happens when the power of attorney person uh, falls out with other members of the family. You'll have seen the uh, case in the US where the husband of the woman who'd been in PVS, persistent vegetative state for 14 years, wanted treatment withdrawn and her parents fought him tooth and nail through the courts to try and prevent it. That was in the news two years ago. Um, so the person with the power of attorney is the person who has the decision making. Yep, there's another one. Thank you. On the back of what you've just 
just said, in the situation where somebody has thought they knew what the process of dying would be like and they've written down in a document what they would like to happen and then just prior to, prior to an emergency which has required the power of attorney to step in, if their previous discussion has gone against what is written, which has no right to then you're going to have to think very hard and discuss and try and come to a decision if necessary, get an outsider in to help you make help you decide. That sort of thing's not very likely to happen because of course in often in the circumstances we're talking about, what somebody is talking about is completely unfeasible, you know, it just wouldn't be any use. But and if it happens then you have to get a, you have to get an outsider to help help you in the discussion, help broker the discussion. But usually these things can be resolved with open and frank discussion. At least that's been my experience. Hi, you touched on the tech issue before. Mm. I just had a query, I worked with a colleague that said to me that dying from aspiration and pneumonia is a horrible death and that you should actually um, you know, things like pigs, of course, can um, reduce the chances of um, this one of these conditions. Mm -hmm. I just sort of wanted to know your opinion. Yeah. Death by inspiration and rape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Well, they. You know, can't be accepted. Yeah. Well, it depends how you manage the pneumonia. Um, it used to be said, some of you may have heard it, it was certainly in all the medical textbooks when I was a lad, longer ago than I care to mention that pneumonia was the old man's friend because it killed you quickly and peacefully. And you can make sure that it kills somebody quickly and peacefully by the judicious use of morphine uh, without antibiotics. So I think dying from inhalation pneumonia is only a bad thing if somebody doesn't manage your pneumonia correctly. That's what I would say. And on the matter of pegs, Having a peg in doesn't reduce your risk of aspiration. In fact, in some circumstances, it can increase it. Because if somebody foolishly feeds you too much too fast and you regurgitate, then you're going to aspirate half a litre, not just a gobbet of saliva. So you mustn't get the idea that peg tubes are the answer to swallowing difficulty. They're the answer to nutritional support but swallowing difficulty and airway protection is not cured by having a peg. And I personally think that if somebody gets an inhalation pneumonia and you manage it correctly, then they die very peacefully. Because they go on, if they, especially if it's pneumococcal pneumonia, they go unconscious and die very promptly.